So we'll be covering trellis coded modulation or TCM. This appears in chapter 9 of our textbook Sklar and in particular in section 9.10 and this set of pages. So trellis coded modulation is uh, distinctive from uh, another kind of coding we've looked at earlier which was called gray coding. So let's just remember what is gray coding and we have the example here for uh, 8PSK. So for instance, suppose that uh, one of the uh, symbols in our APSK is, you know, right about here, and we assign to that uh, angle the bit sequence 001. And if we were just not caring about uh, how we assign the bit sequence, we could just, for instance, just uh, count in binary. And if we count in binary, well, we would start, start here with 0, 0, 0, 0, 001, 2, 3 in binary, 4, etc., all the way around to 7 in binary. But the problem with this was that when we get to uh, uh, neighboring uh, symbols here, which have very, very different um, changes in the bits, uh, for example, there is a Hamming distance of 3 between these two sequences. In other words, all three bits change in the assignment from here to here. And the problem with this is, you know, nearest neighbors are where most of the errors occur uh, in a transmission because the noise could tip you over the uh, threshold. Here's the threshold. And if it tips you here, one symbol error will lead to three bit errors, which is, you know, unacceptable. So what we do is we use instead something called a gray code. And in the gray code, when we make the assignment between symbols, for instance, now uh, this angle, this symbol will be assigned a 0, 0, 0, just like last time. But now when we go uh, one neighbor, closest neighbor over, we're being very careful so that the nearest neighbor, there's always only one bit that changes. So that when we have a symbol error, that will only give us one bit error. Okay, so that's like the best possible outcome. So that's what we want, which is why like from here to here, it's just the very first bit that changes, but the second and third bits do not change. So if we do make an error between these two symbols, we'll only make an error on the first bit, but the last two bits will have no error in it. So that was gray coding. So gray coding is an assignment or bit mapping. Is essentially a bit mapping by which I mean we take a bit sequence and we assign it to a symbol. So the mapping is for each one of these eight symbols, here I have an, a, a mapping, I have a specific binary sequence which is associated with each one of the symbols in this constellation of eight symbols. So trellis-coded modulation is a combination of a bit sequence allocation and convolutional coding, or error correcting coding. So the bit assignment is kind of like gray code, kind of like a first step. And the second step is in the error correction code where we introduce temporal correlation uh, between symbols. So in trellis-coded modulation, the idea of modulation and error correction is no longer two separate steps which are independent from one another. So how does that change when we go to trellis coded modulation versus what we've seen so far? We started out with modulation, then we added convolutional coding or error correction coding, and now we're going to somehow combine them into trellis coded modulation or TCM. So before I show you exactly how we do it, uh, let me go back to this example of 8PSK. Because what we want to do in trellis-coded modulation is sort of understand that there are certain unfavorable pairs, those being the nearest neighbors and where we had to be careful because those errors happen very often. But think about other pairs where errors are very infrequent. For instance, between these uh, symbols the probability of having an error is really, really low. I mean, the worst case is neighboring symbols, and maybe the next one is, you know, a little bit farther, well, quite a bit farther. 
Um, but now we're sort of at the maximum separation that any two pairs of symbols in this constellation can have. So maybe we could take advantage of that. And that is sort of the uh, idea behind trellis-coded modulation. To look at this collection of pairs of symbols which are actually pretty far apart and pretty robust to noise. So we recognize that some symbols, some symbols have properties that we might want to exploit. So trellis-coded modulation, it is a uh, error correcting code. So there is a, an expansion in the number of bits in a block, if you will. So if we have k message bits, just like with other kinds of error correcting codes, we're going to add p parity bits so that we have a total of n bits which is transmitted. So I put in k bits, I add to it some parity bits, or the redundancy from the error correction, and that gives me uh, n bits. So if I have, how many symbols do I have when I don't have any co uh, uh, coding? Well, that would be 2 to the k. There would be k message bits to send, and I would modulate them onto a specific symbol. Now, what I do for trellis-coded modulation is I change the modulation depending on how much redundancy I give to my code. Before, remember, before they were two separate steps, now they're being handled together. So if I have p parity bits that I've added, and I want to take that new block, which is now size n, and I want to do a modulation with that message bit for trans, uh, message se uh, bit sequence or message for transmission, now I have to come up with a different modulation, a different constellation, a larger constellation. So basically what we're doing with trellis-coded modulation is taking a basic 2 to the k quam modulation and instead doing a modulation of 2 to the k plus p quam. This means there's no bandwidth expansion. Of course, because I'm doing a larger quam, that means that each one of the symbols in the constellation is going to be closer. So now what I'm doing is I'm taking this idea of I'm going to have closer symbols because I'm going from 2k to 2k plus p, and I'm going to put my coding in in a way to make, to overcome that. The passage, uh, let's, let's look at it some examples. If I have qpsk, I've got Four, um, point, uh, four symbols in my constellation, and they're relatively far apart because when I put in, um, let's say, 16, or then, of course, if the, uh, if the uh, average energy is the same, then these are going to be relatively closer to one another. The d-min is going to be uh, smaller than it was here where I could spread them out using all the power, uh, the average energy that I have to spread them out. So there is the idea of, you know, these are, this d min is going to be, you know, smaller than this d min. And because, you know, it um, uh, gets smaller, because I have the same average energy and now I have to spread it over 16, uh, so I'm going to have more errors. But the trellis coded modulation says, uh, I'm going to. Uh, take care of that with coding. Now I say here that there's no bandwidth expansion. Why do I say that? Because before I would have to spend, if I, I would have the strategy that I used before when modulation was separate from, uh, from the coding, I would say that I had to say k bits per second and then I, later I'd have to send n bits per second to keep the same raw data rate because there was redundancy here. So I had to send them faster so that the, when I took off the redundancy, what was left was transmitted at the same bit rate. So to maintain same effective bit rate, you know, useful bits, not redundant bits for coding, if I wanted to have the same effective bit rate, that meant that I had to use, I had to send coded bits faster. And of course, faster transmission means more bandwidth. So if I just do one modulation format, it's always 2 to the k quam, and I add coding, then I have to go 
more bandwidth in order to keep the same bit rate. But here, what I do instead is I change my modulation format. So if I have P equal 2, and I go from QPSK to 16 QAM, then I'm sending at the same bit rate, because here, when I was sending at this bit rate, there were only uh, two bits per symbol. Now I'm sending at the same bit rate, same bandwidth. Uh, now I have four bits per symbol, but two of them are redundancy bits. Two of them are parity bits. And so they're not going, they don't really uh, give me, um, they don't contribute to making a faster bit rate. So here the bit rate is the same because I have two useful bits, no coding. And now down here, I've got four bits, but only two are useful. The other, well, useful. <laughs> directly related to the, the bit rate. The other two are parity bits, and they're useful because they're going to help me correct bits and give me a better probability of error. But when I do this, when I go from two bits to four bits, no bandwidth expansion, there's something to pay, and that, paying, that payment is the fact that I have you know, closer uh, symbols, and they're closer together. But of course, I'm giving it parity bits, I'm correcting errors, so the fact that this dmin is smaller, I'm going to make more errors, but I'm going to correct them. And so the net effect is very positive. And so that's why trellis coded modulation is a good strategy and a very popular one uh, in, in uh, communications. So if you remember, this was the sort of generic block diagram for a communication system, transmitter side, receiver side. Here's the channel in between the transmitter and the receiver. So when we do coding of binary sequences, the binary bits come in, and the first thing we do is we run them through an encoder, either a block encoder or a convolutional encoder. But basically, at the transmitter side, we take the bit sequence, we encode it, and at the receiver side, once we've done the demodulation, we've just got a sequence of bits, then we put it through a decoder. And of course, in between, there's this modulation where I pick which constellation I'm going to use. Am I going to use QPSK, FSK, QAM, whatever I choose to do, I take that encoded sequence of bits and I just make some assignment about which modulation format I'm going to use. Two separate independent steps, completely independent choices. What code rate I use, what modulation I use, whether it's phase, whether it's frequency, whatever. Now, when we go to trellis coded modulation, if essentially what we're doing is these two blocks are now merged into one block, one trellis coded modulation block, where I do both the coding operation and the modulation operation in one step. So that was a contrast of when they were separate. And I, I said that I could go from 2K to 2K plus P, and it would, you know, not matter. Excuse me, I, it was arbitrary which P I used. Now, in practice, if I look at the coding gain, when I use one parity bit, two parity bits, three parity bits, well, each time I add a parity bit, that D min is getting smaller and smaller. And there's this trade off on the complexity of my decoder and the gain that I get, and like, most trellis coded modulation has one parity bit. That basically that compromise between gain and complexity is really at a sweet spot for p equal one. So let's take uh, an example of how we would use, you know, one parity bit. I could, for example, apply it to pulse amplitude modulation. So here I have four. Uh, symbols in this constellation for PAM, and it's PAM, which means it's a uh, one-dimensional signaling uh, signal space. And if I'm going to go from two squared to get four points, I'm going to go to two cubed in order to go from four points to eight points when I use. Um, okay, so this is you know k equal four. This is um, K plus 1 equal 3, which gives me uh, 2 to the 3 gives me 
8 Pam, right? So here I had two bits of message. Now I have three coded bits on the transmission. So that includes two message bits plus a parity bit. Um, this was for Pam. I could have done the same thing with QPSK and gone to 8PSK. Or I could take 16 QAM, for example, where I have K, um, I'm, I'm sorry, K equal 2, very sorry, 2 to the K equal 4 for 4 Pam, that's the M. And here, of course, this is the real one with the k equal 4, and m equal 16, and this, um, of course, we could go up to 32 when we do Trelli-coded modulation for that example. 